Hey guys, in today's video I'm going to be talking about the world's oldest temple, the oldest holy site on the face of the earth. I'm also going to be discussing what I regard to be the world's oldest and truest religious belief system. Stay tuned. So in the southeast corner of Turkey, there's a site known as Gobek Latepi. Gobek Latepi means pot belly hill in Arabic. This site was discovered in 1995 by an archaeologist by the name of Schmidt. And Schmidt excavated this site over a period of several years to uncover that this was an ancient Neolithic Stone Age structure. Gobek Latepi is incredibly significant for understanding the history of our species. Gobek Latepi is as ancient to the Egyptians as the Egyptians are to us. That's to say it's twice as old as the pyramids of Giza and twice as old as Stonehenge. So Gobek Latepi stretches right back into the mist of ancient Neolithic prehistoric man. Now when we look at the site, we don't find any indications of living centers. You know, this place was not used for people to settle or to live. It had no practical purpose for agriculture or for a king or of anything of that kind. What we see is a system built up for religious reasons. It was a site that was dedicated to spirituality, which correlates with what we find in Paleolithic rock paintings and cave art. And from the research of Dr. David Lewis Williams, we now know that those images were spiritual in nature. They were representations of the experiences of shamans who were entering altered states of consciousness. So that for ancient aboriginal communities, dreams, hallucinations, and altered states were meaningful sources of information that were appropriate to the entire community. That means that individuals in the community revered the shaman for his ability to enter altered states of consciousness and then to return with meaningful information for everyone. When we look closely at these aboriginal systems of belief, what we discover is that these, these religious systems don't really have deities in the way that we understand them. Instead, what they revere are the spirits of animals. These are the animals that they find in their environment, so bears, eagles, and wolves, and they refer to the spirits of these animals. So there's the wolf spirit, the buffalo spirit, the lion spirit. They, these different animals would come to incarnate and manifest the different psychological energies experienced by the people in the community. So you see, for ancient aboriginals, there was no boundary, no distinction between what they felt and the energies which informed nature. They believed the feelings in the body to be forces of nature and to be the same forces which were responsible for all of the different e events that you see in the environment. Okay, so a feeling of anger could have been identified with a thunderstorm. The, the feeling of anger was responsible for a feeling within you, but it was also responsible for this external phenomena. The clouds would become angry, and consequently you'd have a thunderstorm. Or perhaps you would have a feeling of thirst, which was appropriate to the ground, which would soak up the water really quickly. So the aboriginal might say that the ground is thirsty, when we would say that it's simply dry. So you see, Aboriginal people were living in a state of mind in which their feelings were projected onto the inanimate objects of their environment. And this is the way they understood themselves. They understood themselves in relation to the environment as you would are in relation to your feelings. So it was the job of the shaman to act as the go-between between between this world of animal spirits and feeling energies and the members of the community. When we look at the images of shamans, they're always represented in some kind of garb that makes them similar to the animals of their environment. We find shamans with the heads of eagles, we find shamans with the heads of bears, and they would dress themselves in these ways to manifest and incarnate the energy, the spirit, the feeling, the instinct of that animal. What's interesting is when we move further in time, we discover that with the institutionalization of civilization, these different shamanic images, these images of the shamans with the heads of animals, is transfigured to become the gods themselves. So that no longer do we see the shaman incarnating this emotional energy, we instead see a concretized notion of the deity itself. You know, so these different deities were really a prehistoric memory of this tradition of shamanism which existed for these aboriginals. As we move further still in history, what we discover is that at some point, the prophets of the monotheistic movement discovered that all of these different psychological energies were being controlled or manipulated by one central force within the psyche. This is what Carl Gustav Jung refers to as the self-archetype. This notion of the self-archetype was projected to become the concept 
of Yawanistic deity, this, this idea of one supreme god who is responsible for not only organizing all of the forces within the psyche, but all of the forces within nature as well. The only place we see this idea moving beyond is when we go to India or the early traditions of Christianity, especially Gnosticism. What we discover there is that Christians, Hindus, and Buddhists recognize that this central force within the psyche, this self-archetype, this projection which would become the notion of one supreme god, was in fact the central nucleus of one's own psyche. So that in India we find the wisdom of thou art that, the notion of the Atman, or in northern India we find the concept of Buddha nature. That's to say that these religions recognized that this notion of God was really little more than a projection of one's own central self, one's own central notion of consciousness within the psyche. So what this does is it liberates us from the obligation to try and discover God in some physical way, which frankly is impossible. Instead, we have to recognize that God is an aspect of our own mind. He's an aspect of our own psychology. And when we look at these early aboriginal communities, what they do is they reveal to us the only real religion, the only true religion, the religion of first-hand experience, the religion of visions and dreams and altered states of consciousness. This is the oldest religion, it's the truest religion, and when we look at all different spiritual systems, they're all built on the experience of one individual or a number of individuals having some hallucinatory experience or some experience appropriate to an altered state of consciousness. The biblical prophets would retreat into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, which by the way will cause you to hallucinate. The yogis of India would sit and starve themselves under trees in the woods and expose themselves to the intense tropical heat and dehydration until they would have profound religious experiences during trance. When we look at aboriginal communities, we see them using methods of dehydration, psychotropic su substances, and even sensory deprivation to induce altered states of consciousness. So that ultimately, this tradition of shamanism is the oldest and truest form of religion. And really every form of religion that's developed since then is really just added on. And it's a complicated form of this basic fundamental form of faith. If you guys found this video useful, please share it, post in the comments down below, throw me a like, and as always, thanks for watching. Thanks for stopping by. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and share.